So if we want higher channel bandwidth, we need to look elsewhere in the radio spectrum. So this UHF bit here, that's kind of where all, all the good stuff is. It's a good wavelength, the UHF band, because it operates predominantly at non-line of sight. Okay, the antennas themselves are not particularly large. The power versus cost versus sort of benefit, if you like, is, is a reasonable set of compromises in that UHF band. And indeed, in that UHF band, somewhere between sort of 600 and 3000 megahertz, we've deployed pretty much everything, you know, so all the 2G stuff is in there, the 3G stuff is in there as well. And the 4G stuff has sort of all been deployed somewhere in that band. 5G isn't millimeter wave. Uh, you don't have to put it in the millimeter wave band. If you can find space in the UHF band, well, you can stick it in there. I mean, T-Mobile in America, for example, their first 5G deployment, their first layer in the network, if you like, is actually at 600 megahertz. Uh, now, obviously what that means is they're building pretty large radio cells, but what it also means is that they can roll out the radio coverage very, very quickly. So they'll have a, a well-covered 5G network. Now, it will not be a high capacity network because of the, the nature of the large cells and the fact that they don't have a lot of spectrum. There's no 400 megahertz channel that they can deploy uh, you know, from uh, the 600 megahertz band. So they're relatively speaking narrow band channels, you know, in the order of, you know, 20, 30 megahertz, and they are deployed over very wide areas, um, which leads to poorer system capacity. So you can stick 5G wherever you want, really. But obviously what we're doing is chasing high capacity, high bandwidth, which means we've got to look elsewhere. So that means we start looking somewhere in this part of the band. Now, one thing that you may well be aware of is that there are two identified frequency ranges. So there's an FR1, and FR1 runs from, it's about 400 megahertz to about 6,000 megahertz. And there is a frequency range two, which runs from something like 24 gigahertz to about, it's about 56, it's a little bit higher than that now, I think, but 56 gigahertz. So that's clearly up here in the millimeter, in the millimeter wave band. And that means that there's, there's a few things we need to deal with when we get into the millimeter wave band. In, in, in radio propagation terms, there is that sort of recognized truth for that. The higher the frequency, the greater the path loss would be. But it's certainly something that we need to compensate for. We can't just go up into those frequency bands and, uh, and accept the very, very poor coverage or very high path loss that we would expect from such a thing. But of course, as the, as the wavelength comes down and the size of the antenna is also reduced, that means that in, in any given space that we've got to deploy an antenna, we can maybe have not just, you know, one transmit element, maybe, maybe several, you know, maybe hundreds of transmit elements if, uh, if the conditions were right. And if we're going to go to the bother of putting many hundreds or thousands of transmit elements into the antenna, well, we might as well take advantage of some of those clever beamforming MIMO techniques. 5G will go wherever you've got space. How much spectrum do you need? Well, as much as possible. Which is the best band to deploy your network in? Well, there isn't a best band. The best kind of um, network is one which has all of the spectrum bands, you know, some low, medium, and the very, very high frequencies all in the same network so that you can optimize a deployment either because you're trying to primarily solve a coverage issue or because you're trying to solve a capacity issue. It's very, very useful, of course, to have in your spectrum toolbox, your long wavelength and short wavelengths that you can deploy all across the network. So there isn't any good or bad spectrum here. The only good spectrum is all of it. Right? You want all of it as much as you possibly can. So there are certain bands that are recognized in different parts of the world. So there's some FCC American bands there. There's European bands here. We still need some harmonization. Strictly speaking, you can't just grab some random bit of spectrum and deploy your 5G network in there because of course you need to make sure that the devices you deploy in your network, so mobiles and base stations, that they have support for that particular spectrum band. And if you just got some you know, random bit of spectrum you had floating around somewhere, there's a pretty good chance that's not going to be supported by the most popular chipsets. So you'd have to go to somebody like Qualcomm and say, you know, please, can you build me a chipset that will work in this odd frequency band? And they'll probably say, yeah, okay, but it'll cost you, you know, your $10 billion to develop the, uh, the chipset. So it makes sense then for all of the operators, regardless of their location in the world, for everybody to agree upon a set of harmonized frequency bands. And then whoever's building the chipsets for the base stations or for the mobiles, you know, we can build support into those chipsets for those harmonized bands. And then the cost will come down. The chipsets for 5G will reduce in price 
probably well below the typical cost of an LTE chipset because the number of devices that we're going to build for 5G will be one to two orders of magnitude greater than we ever built on LTE. Because if the whole machine type communication market kicks off, then there will quite literally be tens of billions of things which will be connected. And when you start building tens of billions of things, then the cost can be made uh, relatively cheap, provided that we can find a good bit of spectrum to put them in and harmonization of those spectrum bands.